Sunday after, after Pentecost, the epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Catholics in Rome, chapter 8. Brethren, I reckon that the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come that shall be revealed in us. For the expectation of the creature waiteth for the revelation of the sons of God, and the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him that made it subject in hope. Because the creature also itself shall be delivered from the servitude of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. For we know that every creature groaneth and travaileth in pain, even till now. And not only yet, but ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption of the sons of God, the redemption of our body, in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Luke, chapter 5. At that time when the multitude pressed upon Jesus to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genezareth, and he saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were out, gone out of them, and were washing their nets. And going up into one of the ships that was Simon's, he desired to, him to draw back a little from the land, and sitting, he taught the multitudes out of the ship. Now when he had ceased to speak, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said to him, Master, we have labored all the night, and we have taken nothing. But at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a very great multitude of fish, and their net broke. And they called to their partners that were in the other ship that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they were almost sinking. Which when Simon Peter saw, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was wholly astonished at all that were with him at the draught of fish which they had taken. And so were also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were Simon's partners. And Jesus says to Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And having brought their ships to land, leaving all things, they followed him. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. So I'd like to remind you that at the end of June in Virginia, there will be near Father Ringrose's parish, actually on his property, there will be the... Um, celebration for the 25 years of the Episcopal consecrations done uh, in 1988. So Bishop Williamson will be there to offer the solemn Episcopal Mass and uh, please pray, pray for this whole situation in the Catholic Church. Our Lord said when the shepherd is struck, the sheep scatter. So really, there will always be, always be warfare on this earth, but this crisis in particular of the faith will not be solved except through the powerful intercession of Our Lady and until the Pope, who is the Vicar of Christ, who is the head of the Church, the, the visible head, until he gets his, uh, recovers the Catholic faith, recovers the Catholic faith of tradition. And that's why we must uh, pray, pray for him, especially that he will fulfill what the Virgin Mary asked him to do, which is to consecrate Russia to the Vatican Mary. And none of these popes of Vatican II have done this. So pray. And um, I remind you also, um, do try to read in particular the great writings of Archbishop Lefebvre to keep a clear mind in this crisis, especially they have uncrowned him. He, he, he says in there that the worst disaster in the history of the church was Vatican II. And 
he exposes why religious liberty is so serious a crime against Christ's kingship and uh, that it has been condemned by the church numerous times. And also, uh, you know, the council as a whole permeated with the modern philosophy and modern theology. So, try to read these things. I encourage, of course, you to try to read the um, conferences of Archbishop Lefebvre one year after the consecrations and two years after the consecration. They're very powerful, and they're very clear, and they guided, they help to guide us in this uh, particular crisis of our dear society. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. During this week, in the sacred breviary that the priests pray, the story goes to the time of King David, and in particular, uh, his battle with Goliath. So all of us, of course, know the story very well. The Israelites are threatened by the Philistines. The Philistines can crush them. The Israelites have gone careless towards God. They have abandoned His commandments. They have started becoming ecumenical with false religions. Their sons are starting to marry non-true religion girls and they become lax and God is going to punish the Israelites but God has also uh, raised up a saint among them and Saint David of the Old Testament he was a shepherd, he, he tended to the sheep to show you what kind of young man he really was when his sheep were threatened he killed a lion with his bare hand and he killed a bear with his bare hands. That tells you what caliber of uh, a boy this was. So here he sees the Israelites threatened and they're arguing among themselves, well should we surrender? What should we do? How can God abandon us? And they're afraid to go to war. And day after day the Philistines are threatening, Goliath comes and makes an offer. He says, well, let's be peaceful, peaceful about this. We don't need to shed all this useless blood. Just come out and face me. Anyone, give me your strongest man, and uh, we will go at it. And if, we, if I win and crush you, you are our slaves. So, the Israelites are threatened, they're afraid, and St. David rises up, moved by the Holy Ghost, and he says, I will go. He goes to King Saul, let me, send me, I will go to face him. So they try to suit David up in all the armor and the chain mail, and it doesn't fit him. So he says, just let me go as I am. And he goes, and all he brings, he goes, to the brook, he takes out five stones, he puts it in his leather satchel, and then he goes, he takes one of the stones, pay attention to the details because this is all the literal meaning. He takes one of the little stones and puts it in his sling, and he goes out to face Goliath. And Goliath, of course, is mocking him. Uh, and calling him a dog, calling him, uh, you know, all the adjectives in the book. And David face goes to face him, putting his trust in Almighty God. And he swings and swings and swings, and Goliath is threatening. And uh, finally David unleashes the rock, nails Goliath between the eyes. Goliath goes falling to the ground. And St. David jumps on his back, throws off his helmet, takes his hair, takes his sword out of the scabbard, and chops his head off. And he holds the head high in victory, with all the blood and veins dripping. And all the Israelites cheer and shout, you know, with a great, like a stadium, ready for battle. And they go and attack the Philistines. And God spared them, God gave them a victory, thanks to St. David. 
So that's the literal meaning. Now, as Catholics always do and should do, we turn to the fathers of the church and St. Thomas Aquinas and all the doctors, but particularly the fathers who have spoken about this. And the fathers are like our big brothers, they're like our fathers in the spiritual life. We are like the little kids who get on the back, on the shoulders of our older brothers or our fathers and to see above the literal meaning, over the fence, to see the green pastures and the fruits and the trees of the real meaning of the scriptures. What's the, the deeper meaning, the mystical meaning? And so we turn to St. Augustine, St. Anselm, St. Basil, and uh, St. John Chrysostom. So what do they say about this so simple a story? And it's a real event, it really happened. David is a real figure of history. He was really king, he, was really, he wrote all the Psalms inspired by the Holy Ghost. Firstly, everything in the Old Testament points to the New. Everything in the Old Testament is a shadow of the reality which is the New Testament. And all the figures and events of the Old Testament in some way point to our Lord Jesus Christ. In some way they point to Him. And St. David, says St. Augustine, always, almost in every event of his life, almost, points to our Lord Jesus Christ. And in particular this. So, St. David prefigures Christ. He, he is chosen, he, he's appointed to go face the enemy. Because God the Son alone could save the human race from the curse of sin and eternal damnation and separation from God. Only the blood of our Lord could redeem us. So what happens? He puts on, David puts on the, the armor and it doesn't fit him. What is that? St. John Chrysostom says, the, the old armor is the Old Testament ceremonies. Our Lord Jesus Christ is going to put an end to the, He's going to fulfill and terminate these animal sacrifices and the sprinkling of blood and having only one sanctuary throughout the whole world whereby God is offered and honored and loved by the sacrifices of the animals. That will change. Because Christ will fulfill all the blood sacrifices being the lamb butchered on the cross himself. So the Old Testament ceremonies will come to an end. But not the Old Testament morality. And not the Old Testament uh, preparation for Christ. So Christ goes to the brook. De Torrente in Via Vibet says the psalm, which is chanted at, at Sunday Vespers today, um, that he will drink from the torrent on the way. And what is that? St. Augustine says, Christ will drink the torrent. That is, he will bear the passion, go through the terrible suffering of the passion. And he will take five stones from this river, from this brook. Five stones. Why five, St. Augustine says? Because the five wounds of Christ are the triumph over Satan. They are the victory over sin. And he puts them in a leather, a leather pouch. And the leather, of course, is stretched skin. And St. John Chrysostom will say, Jesus Christ stretched out on the cross is the one who has victory. And the five wounds triumph over sin, over Satan. And that's why the powerful uh, sign of the cross, showing the five wounds of Christ, five wounds. And every time a priest drives out the devil from a house, from a baby at baptism, there's all up to five exorcisms where the devil is commanded to leave. Always the sign of the cross. Always the power of Christ's blood. What washes you when we come sinful and loaded with our sins before the, the sacred heart of Jesus in confession? What washes, what frees you from the slavery to Satan? The blood of our Lord. The blood of our Lord, shed through His five wounds. And in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, what is offered to the Father? The five wounds. Five precious wounds. And at the end of the world, the five wounds will shine 
in Christ's body as he judges the entire human race and the angelic race will be there. So, the five wounds, and David takes one of the small rocks and puts it into the sling. This also has a great meaning because Daniel the prophet saw a little stone that was hewn out of a clean rock. That is, Christ in his human nature, born of the pure Virgin Mary. And this little rock, like Christ born in Bethlehem, almost unknown to the world, unnoticed in his 30 years of his life on earth in the Holy Family of Nazareth, that little rock will grow and grow. And in his public life, Christ will become more known by the miracles, by the prophecies being fulfilled, and by his preaching of Catholic truth. And so this rock will grow and grow, and St. Daniel sees this rock grow so that it crushes the altars of the idols. And that is Jesus Christ, the spreading after Christ died on the cross by his victory, the, the spreading of the Catholic faith all throughout Europe up until the high Middle Ages. And even then, in the 1500s, when Europe will be torn in half almost by the Protestant Revolution, the Virgin Mary will look after her children in the Americas. And there will be a whole harvest of souls converted to our native Guadalupe in both North and South America. So the spreading of the Catholic faith uh, and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost so St. David launches this little rock, which prefigures Christ, and nails Goliath. Who is Goliath? Goliath is the prince of this world, Satan. Goliath was a real figure, he was a real historic man, but he also prefigured, because God writes history this way, there's the literal meaning and the, and the many other meanings, but among them is the mystical meaning. And uh, the rock nails Goliath. That is, Christ by his death conquers Satan. And Goliath goes crashing to the ground. David, the young man, jumps on his back, tears off his helmet, cuts off his head with the sword of Goliath. And what is the sword? The sword prefigures the cross. The victory of the cross over Satan. And the cross is the shape of a sword. And by that cross, Christ frees souls from the slavery to sin, drives out the devil, has victory over the power of Satan, over sin, over death itself. And by the cross, everything is by the cross. Uh, the exorcist in the time of, in the 80s, there was a new Vatican II revised edition of the exorcisms. And the exorcists were trying to use this new Vatican II version to drive the devil out of souls, out of possessed people. And the devils would, would howl and scream and just laugh at the priests. Just laugh at them because this, this new Vatican II edition was a joke. So these priests came to the Pope, John Paul II, and said, look, this isn't working. The devils are just laughing at us. And the Pope uh, gave permission for them to use the old, uh, the old uh, ritual, which of course is full of the signs of the cross and full of the words of the scriptures and the commands to the devil in the name of Christ to leave. So it's by the cross, the victory. And so Goliath is defeated and the Israelites attack the Philistines and they have victory. So. Uh, another another similar story I won't go into here, but that's the, the story of Judith, which is very interesting to read. But how does she have victory? She prefigures the Virgin Mary, and she, with a sword, also cuts off the head of King uh, of the General Holofernes, which brings victory to the uh, Israelites. <clears throat> and this, of course, prefigures the great triumph of the Virgin Mary crushing the head of the devil. But it's through the cross, because Mary is co-redemptrix with our Lord, by the cross. And that's why the, the only religion, the only religion throughout the entire history of the world that holds high Jesus crucified 
the sign of the cross and makes the sign of the cross is the Roman Catholic religion. Animals don't do it because they don't know their God. Atheists don't do it because they reject and, and refuse to know Him. Heretics don't do it, Protestants, Baptists, Mormons, they don't make the sign of the cross. They don't make that sign of, the, of our salvation and victory over hell. The, um, more, the Muslims don't make the sign of the cross, the Jews don't make the sign of the cross. And this specifically marks a Catholic, the sign of the cross. And that's why you should fearlessly make the sign of the cross. And never be afraid to make the sign of the cross in public places, public restaurants. Look at even the, the, the World Cup soccer players. They have no shame to make the sign of the cross before the, before the whole world on TV. To give God glory for their goals and uh, trusting their hearts are good. So be fearless because this cross is our victory. And as Catholics we want the cross not only on our churches, we want it on our constitution. We want the cross and the sacred heart of Jesus and Mary on our flag. <coughs> we want the sacred heart and the kingship of Christ over our whole country, over all countries. And that's the, that is the social doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ's kingship. So, <clears throat> St. David has this great victory, and that prefigures our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have in this, in this epistle, St. Paul, who is telling the Catholics in Rome, who at this time, the persecutions are just starting. The Catholic faith is just taking root in Rome. And the Catholics, of course, uh, many of these letters would have been read in the catacombs. And, he, and then St. Paul says to them, I reckon that the sufferings of this time are nothing compared to the glory to come. And he's telling that to the early Catholics. Yes, you're gonna, our Lord told the apostles, you're going to have sorrows in this life. You're going to carry many crosses. But the suffering of this life is nothing compared to the glory to come. Bear patiently the cross. And be ready to suffer for the Catholic faith. And uh, with Father Pfeiffer and I, had to have, we just came back last week from Ireland and England. And uh, even in uh, northern in Belgium, we discovered that a, a, a little, in, a little uh, account of history that's not well known, is that during the French Revolution, we all love and, and esteem the great Vendée Catholic soldiers in France. But there was also the great soldiers, the Catholics, who rose up in Flanders, northern, northern part of Belgium, which actually would be the area where Archbishop of Fed is from, the northernmost part of France on Flanders. And there rose up there a great army, over 25,000 Catholic men went to war and were slaughtered and martyred for the faith. And hundreds and hundreds of priests martyred. And, uh, and their shout was, for God and for hearth. For God and for hearth, they were saved. And, um, and then we look at England, we look at Ireland, we look at the Catholics <coughs> in Scotland and Wales. How many hundreds and hundreds of martyrs? And we got to pray, of course, at the incorrupt head of St. Oliver Plunkett, who was a bishop ordaining priests out in the forest, out in the woods, uh, and saying Mass in barns, in homes, and keeping the Catholic faith during those persecutions. And in England, how many times the priests had to go into hiding? So much so that the hideout places are still found in these homes. They're still there. And at the Tyburn tree, <clears throat> hundreds and hundreds of priests were dragged from the London Tower and hanged, drawn, and quartered. And one of them was St. Oliver Plunkett himself, who uh, in Ireland he was betrayed, he was arrested, taken back to England, kept in the London Tower for many years even, to break him down. He went through tortures like many of the priests did. Uh, one of the tortures was, of course, the rack 
Another one was called the scavenger's daughter, where they fold them down like in a ball and put an iron ring around them and just corkscrew it into their back and just, it just tightens and tightens. It's one of the most cruel tortures. And these priests never betrayed anyone and they stayed faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ. So when, the, when St. Oliver Plunkett was taken to, be, to the Tyburn tree, he was dragged in his vestments as a bishop. <clears throat> and it's there he, 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 many of these martyrs said, if I had many more lives to give for our Lord, for the Catholic faith, I would give all of them. And uh, he was hanged. They cut the rope when he was almost suffocating. And uh, then they would rip open his belly and pull out his intestines, all 30 some feet of them. And then the normal procedure was also to rip out the heart and hold it up. And they would say, Behold the heart of a traitor. But in the case of St. John Houghton, when they ripped out his heart, when he, he was still alive, he, he was still alive through all the, the, the tortures, and he said, Gee, Oh my Jesus, what will happen to my heart? Because as a priest, he gave his heart to God. As a, as a monk and a nun, they give their life and their heart to God. So he said, what will happen with my heart? And as the, tra as the executioner held out his heart, St. John Houghton died and asked that he hold his own heart. And he died offering his heart to God. And uh, St. Oliver Plunkett, then they finally chopped up, they, this was the quartering, chopped up his legs, chopped up his arms, boiled them, and then they chopped off his head. And then, then they put the arms and the legs, hanged them on spikes on the London Tower as a warning to everybody, you better not be Catholics, you better not house any priests, or have any priests say Mass in your house, or this is what's coming to you. So this was the, now we look at those days, and they, this persecution went on for almost, in, in spurts, sometimes it would be more violent, sometimes it would relax a bit, but in general, almost 200 years in Ireland and England, this, this sort of persecution. And Arianism lasted almost, uh, almost 100 years, in, in some cases more. So we're only 50 years in this Vatican II battle, this onslaught of, against the Catholic faith with Vatican II. We're only 50 years young. And we look at our, our Catholic forefathers, they battled on for hundreds of years. So if we're complaining, you know, oh, well, this, this is, we're back to the hotel masses, we're back to the garage masses, what's going on? Why this crisis? <clears throat> now in tradition, well, it shouldn't be too big of a surprise. The hatred Satan has for the Catholic Church. And we look at this gospel, of course, our Lord honors St. Peter by going into his boat and preaching from there. And of course, the fathers of the Church see in this the role of the Pope, the papacy. And it's interesting to see St. Peter is just coming to know our Lord. It's interesting how he calls him first, <clears throat> he calls him first preceptor. Master, I've, we've, we've fished all night, we haven't caught anything, but at your word, okay, we'll go out and drop the nets. He calls him master. After the miracle of the fish, St. Peter is starting to have the, the Catholic faith. And he comes to him and calls him Lord. So he rises from just a master, a good teacher, rabbi, to Lord. And St. Peter, of course, will gain and grow in all the apostles and realize that Christ is truly God. Truly God and truly King and truly the High Priest, eternal High Priest. So the crisis of the church now is really at the head of the church. The papacy, who is modernist, and Pope Francis is modernist. He is Pope, we're not said of the Congress, but we've got to pray for him. But he is modernist. And just recently he, he, he labeled pretty much traditional Catholics and those who want tradition, Pelagians, who count their rosaries because he received a bouquet of, of rosaries. And he scorned that. 
he scorned that. So he, he has, he's a modernist. But we, he's Pope. What do you do? What do you do? But we cannot compromise. And we learn from Archbishop Lefebvre how to handle this crisis. And what he did. What did he do? He acknowledged the Pope as Pope, recognized him, but resisted him also. He had to. And he didn't fear to tell the Pope, what you're doing is wrong. He told Pope Paul VI, you're disobeying all your predecessors. I have to disobey you. And, I, and you call me a rebel, dissident, well I am. If that means to go against all the destruction of tradition, then I am a rebel. Then I am dissident, he said. And then to Pope John Paul II, was he trying to, to work with ambiguous language, to work out and negotiate uh, negotiate the Catholic faith like it was a, a tool of pol politicking or getting uh, recognized canonically? No. He saw that can, any dealings with Rome, they always are using any method, any maneuver to pull the tradition under the authority of the conciliar popes and the conciliar church to crush Catholic tradition, to crush the Catholic faith, and to compromise it. And the Archbishop, what did he do? He started a seminary without permission. He started seminary in 1969. Only in 1970 did they have the approval. And Archbishop Lefebvre, he continued, he, f he flew all over the world, taking care of the souls who were calling from all over. Bring us the Mass, bring us the sacraments, bring us the, the priests. And he started seminaries. And he was threatened in 1976, don't ordain these priests or you will be suspended, Pope Paul VI. Did the Archbishop cower down? Did he have a false idea of obedience? Well, I better obey now because I'm being threatened. No. No. He saw the faith is in danger and I have to appear to disobey to stay truly obedient to tradition. And that was to the Pope himself. And then when he consecrated four bishops, he saw that was the only way for the Catholic faith to survive. And he himself said, had I gone through with the agreement I had signed, which after, the day after, he retracted and said, I had gone too far. And the Archbishop, he said in his sermon, you, you should hear it, you should reread it, pray over it. And there he says three times, had I gone through with this agreement that I had signed, it would have been Operation Suicide. And he wasn't just thinking for the Society of St. Pius he was thinking for the Roman Catholic faith and tradition, which was threatened by the conciliar destruction, by the new mass, by the, the new priesthood, by the illegitimate Vatican II. Vatican II, with all its errors and, and the errors that permeate every document. And that's why later he will say it's poison through and through, the Vatican II. You cannot say, truly, you cannot say that 95% is acceptable. Why? Because the, even if you take some of the better encyclical, the whole thing is permeated with the subjectivism and the modern theology that permeates Vatican II. The whole thing must be condemned, and someday it will be. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre, in, in, in his book, written in his last years for all the priests, he warned all the priests, the closer you come to the conciliar church, the farther you will drift from the Catholic Church. And they, they are two churches. And he himself said in his conference one year after the consecrations, he said, we have one Pope, but he is head over two churches. The traditional Catholic Church, because he's, he's the Vicar of Christ, so he's the lawful head, but he's also head of this conciliar, man-made fabrication. With its new mass, its new priesthood, its new theology, its new everything. So, the Archbishop laid down the pattern that we are to follow in this new crisis in the Society of Pius X. Because what we have now 
as you, I'm sure you have all uh, seen the pamphlets that have gone out. It's quite interesting. Um, it's, it's, it's puzzling even why the superiors of the Society of the Tenth now are spending so much time, so much money, and so much effort in crushing the resistance priests throughout the world. And all the resistance priests are doing is friendly fire. All we are doing is holding the line that the society has always held. That is all. That's all we want to do. We don't want to compromise with Vatican II, with the new mass, and the new code of canon law. And we don't want to subscribe to these six conditions that basically surrender tradition to the modernists. And we don't want to, to drop the guideline and the directive given by Archbishop Lefebvre, where, where he told, and he stood on this, from now on, he said in 1988, from now on, if Rome wants to call and make an agreement and talk about discussions and talk about canonical normalization, from now on, I will raise it to the doctrinal level. And I will ask the Pope, do you believe in quanta cura of, of uh, Pius IX? Do you believe in Pascendi condemning modernism of Pius X and the anti-modernist oath? Do you believe in quas primas of Pius XI on the social kingship of Jesus Christ? And Pius XII, the modern generalities condemning the modern philosophies and evolution. Do you believe in these things? If you don't, we can't talk. Then we wait until Rome comes back. And since Rome has the promise by the Sacred Heart of Jesus, it will, the gates of hell will never prevail, there will be a day when Rome recovers the faith. But it's not our time, he said. And we must put it in the hands of Our Lady. Had the Society of Advisor Tent kept to that, we would not be in the mess that the society is now in. And what a mess it is. What a fall it was. And they changed that to, we want the agreement without Rome's conversion. And that's, that's the recipe for suicide. Mm -hmm. And one of the new arguments is, well, this whole question of canonical regularization is only a matter of prudence. It's only principles of prudence. And it's true, prudence has its place. Prudence is one of the highest of the moral virtues. But the Archbishop never divorced the role of prudence in the light of the faith. And part of prudence is to have foresight. And he foresaw that an agreement with Rome would mean down the road, the Society of the Tenth will end up accepting the new Mass, accepting the math, new Mass as legitimate, accepting Vatican II in the so-called light of tradition, and accepting the new code. Somewhere down the line, that will happen, as happened to La Berue, St. Peter's, Redemptorist, and the Good Shepherd Institute is now also being cooked and, and, and pressured. So, the Archbishop always saw the faith in connection to any of the dealings with Rome. You can't divorce that from the from the faith and just say, well, it's purely canonical. And uh, that's why I remind you, the, the crisis now in our dear society is the new direction, the six conditions, and especially the doctrinal preamble. Notice it's called doctrinal preamble. It's not called a prudential cannot, uh, preamble. It's doctrinal. And in there, Bishop Follet and the leaders of the Society of Isaac Ten have signed on to accepting Vatican II, saying that Vatican II enlightens tradition, deepens the understanding of tradition. And that's what it says. It's a perfect modernist masterpiece which was not just written overnight. It was prepared very well. And even Bishop Fillet said, well, it's, it, if you look at it with pink glasses, you can interpret it one way. So the liberals can say, well, this could be a matter for a, a deal. And the traditional Catholics with dark sunglasses could look at it and say, well, it's traditional enough. It's acceptable. And that's, that's deadly. Ambig ambiguity is the, is the art of the enemy. 
has no place with traditional Catholics, let alone bishops and priests, let alone popes. So, the preamble is, is very serious. It accepts the legitimacy of the new Mass, and some are going to argue, no, it only says that it's the legitimate promulgation of the new Mass and new sacraments. But that's a false distinction, because what's legitimately promulgated is considered legitimate. And the Archbishop said the new Mass can never be legitimate, because it's something legitimate must be good for the salvation of souls in the Church. And the new Mass just waters down and attacks the, the sacrificial nature of the Mass. And it poisons, it's a poison to the souls. And the new code, of course, is affirmed and accepted. Affirmed and accepted. So, what was feared with making an agreement with Rome, modernist Rome, what everyone knew who, who follows what's going on and reads the Archbishop of Fed, that we all knew that if there's an agreement with Rome, it's so, it's a compromise. Why? Because it puts you under the authority of the modernists, and in five years, six years, four years, the Society of Eisenhower might end up saying that the new Mass is legitimate, might end up saying Vatican II is acceptable in the light of tradition, might have start accepting the new code, and might start slipping and slipping and being more silent against Vatican II, being more silent against the modernism of the, of the modernist popes. That's what we feared with an agreement. But what has happened? What has happened? Why is this crisis so serious? Because there hasn't been, as far as we know, publicly, there has not yet been an agreement on paper. But the very poison that we feared would come with an agreement has been swallowed. And this is where the deception is. And this is why the faith is put in the Society of Hesitant now in such danger. Because this preamble now, it's an official document sent to the Pope officially in the name of the SSPX. And unless that is openly and publicly rejected and repudiated and denounced, the poison is in. The poison is in. And this poison is trickling down to the priest, to the faithful. And now there are many priests who are saying, well, it's not such a bad deal. The, the preamble is only a practical document. Or they're saying some of that it's dead, but it's not dead until it's condemned. And the modernism in there, some of the priests even are saying, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. And how is it possible, for example, uh, the new website of SSPX.org, Reread the mission. Look at the new website, and it's all supposed to be positive. The first article of the Angelus, of the new revised Angelus, the, the whole thing is to be positive now, to be optimistic, and not condemning all the time. But if you don't condemn and, and find the cancer in a body, if you don't fight that cancer, it's going to spread. And this cancer now is in the SSPX of, of the modernism. It's there. And, and, and this is not internet gossip, it's not internet rumors, just as I always say, go to the documents themselves, the general chapter statement, the six conditions, the preamble, the doctrinal preamble. Read them, and then also read the interchange of letters of April 14th last year with Bishop Fillet and the three bishops. The whole new shift. And now, last week, in the Polish website of the SSPX in Poland, has an advertisement uh, declaring, announcing the ordinations of priests for all the priests of the Society of St. Pius X, which is fine, and that's normal. But then in the very same article, without any explanation, without any distinction, without any, they, they list the St. Peter's Society ordinations, and also the Ecclesia Dei ordinations. What's going on? What's going on? And this shows the new direction. 
when Archbishop Lefebvre read his, his conference two years after the consecration. And he says, the people who think along the line of St. Peter's, they are betraying Catholic tradition. Because they want to have the Latin Mass, but they want to, you know, accept Vatican II and be recognized and, and, and be accepted by the conciliar church. But you can't have it both ways. And it's better to stay with the truth and suffer persecution and suffer being kicked around and being suspended and schismatic and all these labels, which are false. Better to stay with the truth in line with all the popes of tradition, the Archbishop of Fed, than to have all the labels you want of being regularized, being canonically normalized, and compromising against Jesus Christ. And this is where, this is, when you get down to the nuts and bolts, this is what's at the heart of the fight right now. Because what does it mean when you accept Vatican II? What does it mean when you accept the new Mass? That means you accept the mockery of Christ as God, which religious liberty does. It reduces Christ to another equal to Buddha, Muhammad, Luther. That's exactly what it's about. <clears throat> attacking the kingship of Jesus Christ. The new Mass attacks Jesus Christ, the eternal high priest, and his royalty, and his sacrificial offering <coughs> in the Mass. And that's why the, the Vatican II is so serious. And Vatican II as a whole attacks the divinity of Jesus Christ. The word supernatural as a substantive noun does not exist. You cannot find it in the text of Vatican II. So, for the leaders of the SSPX to allow a document like this, all right, we could all understand a mistake, all right, and maybe an interview or two. Any of us can make mistakes, all right? If there's a mistake, then publicly correct it. If there's a public mistake, especially in matters of the faith, you've got to publicly correct it. Because the, the faith is not a toy, the faith is not a joke. It is so serious that if I, tomorrow, deny one article of the Catholic faith, knowingly and willingly do so, and I die, I will go to hell. I will not save my soul. And I cannot please God because I, I must believe the true faith to save my soul. And the Catholic faith happens to be coming from the Trinity. It's very objective. It's not from man's opinions. It's a summary of scripture and tradition that is passed down in tradition. That's called the deposit of the faith. And we need to believe these truths to save our soul. So Vatican II attacks that faith. So we must reject Vatican II. And we must reject the new Mass and reject the new Code. And how is it possible now in the Society of the Tenth that they're playing with the faith with these documents like it's a toy? And the Bishop Fillet and the leaders were really serious about saving Catholic tradition. He would publicly denounce and condemn this document, which compromises the Catholic faith. And now they're saying, resistance to what? Well, there it is. Resistance to the attack on the Catholic faith. And, if, and we better resist. We better resist. How many of you can count priests and people that you know who went along with Vatican II and the New Mass, and they're long gone now. They don't even have the Catholic faith. They have a completely new idea. And remember, it's a heresy to say, oh, all religions are equal and they all are just roads to God. That's a heresy. If we believe that, we, we cannot save our soul. And that is the religion of Assisi, <clears throat> promoted by the modernist popes. So, dear faithful, we, we must turn, of course, to the Mother of God. She alone can help us in this crisis. And the darker it gets, the, the, the tougher the fight becomes, means that her hour of triumph is coming closer also. So these are great days God put us in. 
And the Virgin Mary did tell Sister Lucia that there will be a time when the crisis of the church will hit in every soul. All of us have to make a decision. And it's hitting our dear society of the death right now. I had to make a decision. I was asked, either you be silent on all the question about agreement with Rome, be quiet about that, and things will go fine, or you get punished and expelled and silent. And I said, I cannot accept to be silent on what threatens the Catholic faith and tradition. And Archbishop Lefebvre, I told my superiors, Archbishop Lefebvre constantly spoke about the agreement with Rome. For 42 years, for all, ever, ever since the, the drama of Acon in Rome, he always spoke about that. And he always said, yeah, you know, it would be hopeful to make an agreement. You know, there were times when he was hoping that something could be done, but the more he saw how modernist Rome was, and with the Assisi meetings especially, and the receiving of the signs of the Sheba, and visiting the synagogue, he, he, he said by 1988 he could finally just say, no discussion until Rome comes back to tradition. And had Bishop Fillet stayed with that, the, uh, the society of Byzantine would be growing still strong and fighting the way she has for 42 years. But now they're caving in. And I'm not saying every priest is caving in, but I am saying that every priest certainly is in a position now where they have to start making a big choice. Either they preach out against this, this compromise and this new direction, in which case they will be expelled and silenced and punished, but blessed be God. So was our founder, Archbishop Lefebvre. Or they remain silent. And the danger of remaining silent is, if you're silent on questions of the faith, and you're a priest, you took an anti-modernist oath, you have to answer to God. God wants the priest to bark against error, especially when the faith is in danger. So if you're silent, then you start being uh, using new language. And you'll notice in the publications, and uh, I'm told everywhere that the sermons also, you never hear anymore the modernism of this Pope. You never hear anymore of the, of the attacks against modernist Rome. And so why are they spending so much time attacking the resistance when the real enemy against the faith is modern as Rome. And that's more and more being hushed. And thirdly, when you start changing the language, you start changing the ideas. In other words, if the priests don't jump out of the, the hot water coming to boil, they're going to boil. So, it's very grave, because it's the faith it's, it's the faith at stake here. It's the faith at stake here. And none of us have the right to change the faith. And, and, and I go back to those great English martyrs and Irish martyrs. Many of these priests and bishops were respected by the king or the queen. And they were told at times, some of them, and like Thomas More, look, just, just say you signed the oath of supremacy. You don't have to sign it, but just say you did, and we'll let it go, you know, and then life will go on, because I, you know, I like you, and I don't want to have to kill you. And this, uh, in, in, in almost all the cases, the priests and bishops said, no, I cannot give a, even in the appearance of compromising the Catholic faith. That's why Bishop Tissier said, we cannot even give the appearance of working together with modernist Rome by a, a, a canonical agreement. Because modernist Rome is precisely attacking Jesus Christ and tearing down the faith. So let's go to the sacred altar. Very soon the priest will elevate the heart of Jesus to the Father. And you will very soon drink the precious blood that gave strength to those martyrs to go through the tortures some of them went through and the death that they went through. And it gave strength to many Catholics to 
to keep their faith in the most difficult times. And by all means, we need the grace of God now. When in these times, when none of us expected this, this crisis from the top of the society, none of us did. So pray, pray in this Mass, pray to be faithful, pray to imitate the martyrs, pray for the Pope, pray for Bishop Follet, pray that there will be a miraculous turnaround. I still have hope for that, I still have hope for it, but the more I see the, the new direction being confirmed by punishments and the websites and the, the direction it's all taking, it doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like it. In which case, the resistance priests and Bishop Williamson, uh, as Don Thomas Aquinas said, he will have to consecrate bishops. And there will not be a parallel church. It will not be a new church. It will not be a separate or schismatic church. It will be the Catholic Church, as always. But the Catholic Church, in a, in a terrible time of crisis, of survival, it will be Operation Survival Part 2. And uh, these consecration of bishops, which really need to be done, uh, these bishops will just do like the four bishops have always been doing, keeping the faith, taking care of souls all over the world, until Rome comes back to tradition. Until Rome returns to the tradition. So let's pray to the Mother of God in this Mass for all these graces. O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us, 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 O Mary, conceived without sin.